the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, clap those hands, all you people. Hallelujah. This is a wonderful day. And we say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. But we give God praise for our mothers. We give God praise for life, health, and strength. Come on, clap those hands, everybody. God bless you. God bless you. Shall we pray? Father God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for another Mother's Day. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, and your tender kindness today. And we just ask you to bless this worship service so that somebody might be saved, healed, and delivered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We just want to welcome you. Welcome you. We thank God for those of you that are coming on live stream on this Mother's Day here at Second Chance Church. We thank God for all of the mothers that are in the congregation. God bless you today and happy Mother's Day to my wife, to my daughters, to my sister, to all of my family, and to all of my mothers out there. We wish you a 
the best day that you can have in your life. We thank God for you as mothers and what you do and how you put up with us, how you loved us, and God is good to all of us. And one thing we all have in common, if we don't have nothing else, we all have a mother that we came from. And we thank God for the way he did things in this world, amen. As we get ready to go on in worship service, we want you to give and uh, give your tithes and offerings. This is a part of our worship service as well. We're going to bring Pastor JT back, amen, and let him bless us, and we're moving right on in service. Let the church say amen. Amen.
About their children, they would talk about them. Yeah. My mama wouldn't let you say nothing about me. <laughs> so we just thank God for you mothers out there today and all you do for us. And even for those of you that have lost your moms in this in this season or have lost your mothers in years past, we want you to know we're praying for you that. You stay strong and know that they're just sleeping Jesus right now. And that he has them. And I hope that's some consolation and comfort for you today. So don't be in a funk. Because we all got to pass this way too. But just know that God is good and he, he knows what he's doing. So we're going to Joshua. And we're going to back up. We're going to Joshua the second chapter. The first verse. Joshua the second chapter and the first verse. Joshua, the second chapter in the first verse says, Then Joshua, son of Nun, he secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and they entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jer Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house. Because they have come to spy out the whole land. The, but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me. But I did not know where they had come from. Bible says in verse 5, at dusk when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken, my Bible says, but she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as, and as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Amen. I just want to talk about he will change things. He will. He will. He will change things. One of the first lessons we, that we learn in life is even all through the Bible. Is how God has a habit of taking the least, the last, and the left out and carving a space for all of us in his kingdom. When the devil tries to make you think you're worthless and, and no good, when people look at you like you are a zero, God has the capacity to raise up things in your life that you never knew existed when others try to write you off. I believe there's some people here today that have been in a place of zero, that place where others called you worthless, that place that people looked at you or your shortcomings and your issues, and they spent all of their energy trying to tear you down. People even look at you now, and it's hard for them to tell that's where you've been in life. 
But somebody can be a witness that God took you one day, transformed your life, and now he's using you for kingdom building. When others have given up on you, God is just getting started. God is so omnipotent uh, and so amazing. The Ephesians says, now unto him who does exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or think. That, the, that means that God is bigger than all of my problems. That he's bigger than all of my fears. He, he's bigger than all of the mountains that I might have to climb. I, 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 might, I might experience in my life. And, and the more I know about him, the more deeper I fall in love with him. Paul in Ephesians is not just talking God, but he, he's doing God. There's nothing impossible for God. Mothers, you need to realize that because you need to realize that there's no circumstances that has gone too far that he cannot change. There's no problem too big that God cannot solve. There's no sickness that God cannot heal. There's no prayer that God cannot answer. Those, there's no sinner that God cannot save. There's no backslider that God cannot restore. There's no marriage that God cannot put back together again. Humpty Dumpty did sit on the wall. Humpty Dumpty did have a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But somebody should have called on the real king. Because if they had called on the king of kings, he would have worked that thing out. When your life is in the hands of the king of kings, it doesn't matter how shattered and broken your life seems, he can put things back in place again. People of God, I, I, I believe that all of us in this place need to know that no matter what we think, there's a potential in the lives of people we write off. Because of our judgmental spirits, we like to judge sins and lifestyles. And when we judge someone, the devil gets in our ear and, and then he, he tells us that there's no need to pray for them. There's no need to witness to them. There's no need to visit them, give up on him because there's no hope for them. But I, I believe today that regardless of our situation, that God has the power to change us. There's power in the atmosphere today that says somebody's going to leave this service better than they came. God can take you from the bottom and make a hero or a shero out of you. Let me show it to you in the text. Here it is. The final story of Rahab the prostitute, the harlot, the, the whore. And even though, even though that sounds like some hardcore names for Rahab, this story is about the love of God. And how God speaks into the lives of his people. This story is about how God brings us to places of, of restoration. Last Sunday we went with Joshua and the children of Israel. And, and we marched until some walls fell down in our lives. But there was something important that we needed to see on this Mother's Day that happened. That made us look back and see what happened before the walls came down. When the children of Israel... We're about to go into the battle of Jericho. My Bible says Joshua sends two spies to check out Jericho. It's interesting that when they arrive at the gate or the door or the fence of Jericho, that they ended up at a prostitute's house. They went to a house of ill repute because they couldn't fit in. And they knew they also would be welcome. So the Bible says they entered Rahab's house and found out that this woman who's called a prostitute had been touched by the Spirit of God. In other Rahab was in rehab. I hope somebody gets that today. Huh. I want to just say that again. Somebody might have missed that. Rahab was in rehab. Just like, like some of you might be today. You've not arrived yet, but you ought to thank God that you're, you're in rehab. You have no idea what God is working in your life. But you see, you ought to give God glory that you see yourself becoming what God wants you to be in life. The power of God is able to transform lives and able to rehabilitate us and bring us out of places of brokenness and take us to places of wholeness. When you look at Rahab, when you look at people, Stop making assumptions about them until you begin to understand the totality of their conditions. Think, think about where the Lord found you. 
and you'll begin to understand how good God's been to you. See, oftentimes people will see you're right now, but then they don't know about your back then. Do I have any witnesses that when you look at your way back then, or when you look at your not too far back then, you ought to give God glory for where you are right now. Oh my God. In other words, I may not be where I ought to be, but I sure got, thank God, I'm not where I used to be. The, these men, these men there on assignment to go and spy out the land. They come to the prostitute's house. And the king of Jericho got word that the spies in Jericho had stopped by Rahab's house of pleasure. So the king sends a message to Rahab, and he asked Rahab to tell him where the spies were hiding. He asked them to snitch. The king asked them to snitch on the spies. The king says, I'm going to send some soldiers to, to kill them. And, and, and Rahab tells them to tell the king that the spies stopped by, but all they did was pass through. But what's interesting is Rahab had hid these men on the top of the roof of her house. Let, let me give you some cultural context of what life was like back then. There were two classes of prostitutes or harlots. The Hebrew word for harlot is, is call no. It means to commit fornication. It means to commit adultery. The other definition for harlot is prostitute or whore. And the first class of prostitutes were temple prostitutes. This is an interesting thing because in Hosea, the fourth chapter, verses 12 through 14, the Bible speaks about the temple prostitutes. And the role of the temple prostitutes were to reside over the temple, and they were both so men. You don't think I'm just talking about women today. They were both men and women, okay? And they had sex with worshipers who came to worship in the temple. But then the second class of the prostitutes consisted of owners of bars and inns. They had sex with patrons that came in. Rahab is in this second class. She was a, a businesswoman. She owned a bar. Her house was built in the wall of the city. When, she, when you stop by her house, you could get a drink and a whole lot more. Rahab was a woman that was considered defiled. She, she had been touched by many different men. She was a stiletto wearing, fishnet wearing sister. She wore her hair down to her glory. Uh, she was the owner of a house of pleasure, but her name Rahab's means spacious and large which suggests that even though her life might look like it was defiled, there was hidden possibilities inside of her. And regardless of how you look at people and label people, don't ever give up on people because God still has some chapters to write in all of our lives. I'm just glad today that God is not through with us yet. I thank God for that. In a real sense, Rahab, until these spies show up, has been experiencing spiritual death. Rahab is enjoying her life, but she's dying from the inside out. Many of you, you look at people and you marvel them because they look like they're just having one party after another. And you ask yourself, why can't I have this much fun? Why, why can't I go kick it like that? But if you were to interview some of these people, you would really find out how depressed they, they, they are. They drink liquor and try to drown their problems away. But somebody should tell them that their problems know how to swim. They, they get high trying to get above their problems. But somebody ought to tell them today, your problems know how to fly. You got to understand that some things can look good on the outside, but be dying on the inside. Here's Rahab. She, she looks like she's in a dead situation. She, she's allowed herself to be defiled. She looks like she's dying on the inside. Her city is doomed because she recognizes that Israel is about to overtake Jericho. But she's made up her mind. Just because it looks bad doesn't mean I'm going out like that. God still has something for her life. And God still has something for your life today. And somebody needs to understand that God is not through with you yet. 
Let me tell you this. To understand her, you must come to the power where you appreciate the power of her confession. So let's understand what's going on. Joshua has sent these two spies to spy out Jericho. Joshua tells them, go into Jericho so that we can see what we're working with so that he would know what he would have to do when he was about to take the land. So they see this house of repute uh, and they stop by Rahab's house. When the spies meet Rahab, they realize that God has been dealing with this woman, even though she's this fishnet, stiletto-wearing sister. God has been working on this sister. So when she realizes that the soldiers are coming, she, 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 find, she, she takes the men and she hides them. And she tells the soldiers that they are gone. So when the soldiers leave her house, she goes up on the roof and she begins to talk with the men she has hidden. So in your Bible is right here in verse 9 and verse 10 where this story really jumps off. In verse 9, Rahab says to the spies that I know that the Lord has given you this land. And let me tell you why I know it. Because all the people living here in Jericho are living in fear because of the God and your army. She's like, she's like don't get it twisted. I know that we Jericho. I know we got a larger army than you. I know that we have this great wall of security. But everybody, is, everybody around here is afraid. Because she says in verse 10 that we heard how the Lord dried up the water at the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. See, this is why you can't sit back and be afraid of the devil when the devil already knows your God. The devil knows that God brought you out of previous battles. This woman says, I know because I heard. And the thing I love about God is that if your heart is open to receiving him, he will warn you right in the nick of time. Matter of fact, just think about where you might have ended up if you had not heard the word of God and understood that he had a plan for your destiny. Where would you have been if you had not been in church for yourself to hear that there was a better way? Romans 10 and 9 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when she heard for herself, her devotion rose up in her spirit. And she began to declare that I want what you got. I want the God of Israel. Here's a woman that historically has served a, a pagan God. She has lived a rough life. But now she's come in contact with men who serve the true and living God. And she's saying, I want that God for myself. My brothers and sisters, when you come to this place, you will leave the God of Jericho and turn to the God of Israel. She had come to the place where she wanted God for herself. Have you ever come to that place where you said, I'm tired of playing games. I want God for myself. I recognize in him I move, in him I live, in him I have my being. Well, here it is. It comes to a place where you have to understand conversion. And I'm, I'm trying to reach somebody today. Somebody shout conversion. Conversion, conversion. The God, the, 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 the God, the interesting, the interesting thing about this story is that somehow God takes a person with a colorful past. He takes a person with a colorful biography. He takes a person with a jacked up past and God converts them and he uses them for his glory. Now that's, that's real conversion. I'm not talking about where you, where, where, when you're just going to church. I'm talking about real conversion. When you have really been out there and God picked you up and turned your life around. That's when you come to a place of dedication. When you think about how good God has been to you. This woman was converted. She was converted, but she was still a businesswoman. Rahab got converted. Rahab told these men, I love your God, and I'm done with Jericho. She said, Jericho's going to fall. I understand that your God is so awesome that you're going to win, and I want to be with your God. See, Rahab says, I want to be on the winning team now. Remember now, this. she's a businesswoman. So she says, I need to talk to you about something before I let you come off the roof. 
Verse 12 says, Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. She says, in other words, I'm begging you that since I hooked you up, since I didn't snitch on you, I need you to hook a sister up. Since I looked out for you, I need you to look out for me. I need you to spare my mother and my father. And I need you to spare my cousins and cousins and him, man. I need you to, to spare everybody connected to me. I need them to be spared from death. When you come to take the city, spare everybody connected to me. Don't touch them. This is what your haters need to understand, that being connected to you has benefits. Here it is. And they said in verse 14, our lives for your lives. The men assured her, if you don't tell what we're doing, we'll treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. We're going to look out for you. Let me back this up. Because this is about when you really get converted. When you really feel the presence of God in your life. You want everybody in your house to experience the love of God. Yeah. You, you want your mama. Yeah. You want your daddy. Yeah. You want your sisters, your brothers, your cats, your dogs, your mice. Or you want everybody saved. Because this is about destiny. This is like putting a good piece of meat in the skillet with nothing in it and letting it make its own gravy. I, I, I'm going to tell you three things and we're getting up out of here. The first one, a few of you might get. You might grab it out of the atmosphere and have your praise. The second one, someone might decide to run on and see what the end's going to be. And third one, somebody going to leave here with a show enough attitude. Let, let me break it down. When you enter into Jericho, there was a wall. You could identify the house like Rahab's because Rahab's house had a red rope hanging on the outside of the window. The red rope symbolized that this is the spot. Men would come to town looking for the red rope. Uh, that's how I figured out the spies <laughs> knew where to go. They were saved, <laughs> but not delivered. <laughs> so they went to the house where the red robe was hanging. The, the, the cord of scarlet, that thread, that, that part of the scarlet, that red robe that hung from her window was a part of her trade. It was a symbol of the red light district. So when the men saw the cord hanging from the window, they knew a harlot was in the house. But the spies told Rahab, Hang the cord when we leave, but this time don't hang it for man, hang it for God. Because remember, it was these same men of Israel whose ancestors, when they came out of Egypt, they put the blood on the doorposts, and the death angel passed over wherever they saw red blood. So what they were saying is that when you hang this red cord out, when we come back and take this city, when we see the walls fall, and we come in here and we take this city, we're going to pass by that red cord on your house. Look at your neighbor and tell them, I thank God for the blood. I, I thank God that I'm covered because there's some stuff that could have happened to me, but it passed over me because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Does anybody thank God for the blood of Jesus? So when we hang our sins before God, the God we serve sends back mercy and grace. Isaiah 1 and 18 says, come let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, your sins are as white as snow. If they are red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Is there anybody out there listening that thanks God for the blood? Now here's number two. When God showed me this, I got up and ran a lap around the living room. That's how good the second, second one was for me. God gave Rahab new relatives. That's why you need to come to Bible study. <laughs> and Joshua 6, verse 25, the Bible said that Joshua was spared Rahab the prostitute. All of her family and all belonged to her. So she lives among the Israelites to this day. I want you to hold that. Rahab and all her family were divinely delivered from the battle of Jericho. 
And when they were delivered, they were taken to the land of Israel. Rahab is hanging out with a, a new family on a different street corner. In order to understand why this messed me up, you got to see what Matthew teaches us in Matthew 1 and 5. See, a man named Salmon sees Rahab, saves her, and falls in love with her. And because she does not look like what she used to, he marries her. And Salmon is believed to be one of the two spies that she hid on the roof. Well, let me tell you about Salmon and Rahab. They have a son named Boaz. Boaz sees Ruth in the fields gleaming. They have a son named Obaz. Obaz has a son named Jesse. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And Jesse has a son named David. So Rahab is the great, great grandmother of King David and, um, and, and in the family and the blood of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and who comes out of the house of David, which means that Boaz's mama used to be a prostitute. Look at your neighbor and tell him, doesn't matter what you used to be. Doesn't matter what they used to say about you because you're still in the family. They don't have to like you. They don't have to accept you. But thanks be to God, you're still in the family. I thank God that no matter what I've done and what I've been through, I'm still in the family. I give God glory that he keeps me in the family. She got a new reputation. But this is not the last time you hear about Rahab. Rahab's name is mentioned nine times in scripture, but she's also mentioned in the New Testament. And every time her name is mentioned, she's Rahab the prostitute. So I, I, I said, well, God, if you brought her over into our family, why don't you drop the name Rahab the prostitute and just call her Rahab your daughter. Yeah. Why doesn't God drop the, the tag? God does not say Moses the murderer. He doesn't say Abraham the liar. He doesn't say Noah the drunk. So why doesn't God drop that tag? Because the tag is a part of her testimony. Because sometimes somebody needs to understand what God brought you out of. Somebody needs to understand that no matter how long you did it, that God has the power to bring you from a zero to a shero or a hero. People of God, you got to deal with this. Old defile, stiletto wearing, fishnet stocking wearing, hair down to her glory, prostitute. Rahab finds her way into the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 11 and 31, that's when the writer of Hebrews gives us examples of faith. He, he lists Abraham, and he lists Abel, and he lists, lists Enoch, and he lists Noah, but he found room for Rahab the prostitute. It's in your Bible. Hebrews 11 and 31 says, by faith, the prostitute Rahab welcomed the spies, was not killed with those that were disobedient. Rahab didn't have a religious background, didn't have a godly husband at that time, but God took her from the hall of shame and put her in the hall of faith. Second Corinthians says these words that if any man or any woman be in Christ, you are a new creature. All things are passed away and all things become new. So when people try to refer to you about your tag, that, 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 that's so and so. That, that's the one. Tell them, yep, that's me. But I thank God for what he's done in my life. You, you, you let them tell the first part of your testimony, but you tell the second part of your testimony that you've got a whole new lifestyle now because all your haters can ever do is tell the first part because they'll hate or never tell the second part about how God picked you up and turned you around, placed your feet on solid ground. I wish somebody would give God glory because God only knows how to take a mess, a trial, a valley, a, a, and turn it into an amazing miracle. So stop where, stop whining. Stop complaining about how you were raised. Stop complaining about the stuff you, you went through. 
Some of the most extraordinary people in the world have some of the most amazing backgrounds. It's part of their testimony. I'm glad you brought yourself to service today. I want you to know there's a hero in you. There's a shero in you. Mothers, you are queens. You are on top. You're not on the bottom. And God loves you. Why don't we all give God glory for our mothers today? Somebody give God glory. Ain't he all right? Won't he make a way for you? Didn't he open doors for you? Didn't he take you from places that you never thought you would be and put you on a street called straight? He's all right. Mary's baby. Lily of the Valley. Bright morning star. Thank you, Lord. Great man. Thank you. Come on, come on. 